Welcome to Investing Insights, partnered by Right Property Group. This is your host, Phil Tarrant. G'day, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, I'm excited about today. We're going to mix it up a little bit. And as you know, it's just not me here on the uh, Investing Insights of the Right Property Group uh, podcast. Regular co-hosts, and uh, we've been doing this now for nearly two years, and uh, we enjoy it. We've got a particular culture which has uh, been created around the podcast, and it continues to evolve uh, with my two uh, colleagues here, Victor Kumar and Steve Waters, uh, directors of the Right Property Group. Guys, how are you going? Going well. How are you? Pretty good. good, Phil. Now, last time we got together, we did a big Q and A uh, episode. Um, if you haven't listened to it yet, uh, it came out on the thirty first of August. So go and check it out. Uh, I think we dug down into a whole bunch of issues, um, common questions uh, that we've been sort of curating over the last couple of months uh, that everyone wants to know about property investment. But at that point in time, after the uh, after we recorded the podcast, I said to Victor, I said, I want to pop. I want a, uh, a pop topic for the next uh, podcast. So he's been scheming away in, in the background trying to throw something into uh, uh, what we're going to chat about today. So I have no idea. And we've done this deliberately because what I want uh, you guys to see is the uh, organic nature of this particular podcast. Uh, we don't script this. Um, we try and um, take it as it is. And I am a big fan of first impressions about absolutely anything. And uh, that's how I typically lead most observations about what I do in my work and particularly in property about what do I think about something at a point in time. So Victor, I'm going to give some context. Uh, I don't know if you saw it recently, uh, 60 Minutes put together a, uh, a report. It was on a Sunday night where mm-hmm. they, they, they pulled out a couple of punters. There was a property uh, investment analyst, there was a liquidator, there was a property investor, and then there was a real estate agent. And they pretty much beat up the market. So it looks like everything's going to go wrong, mate, and 40% is going to come off property. So we're in a, a period of flux right now, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. I think you guys would probably say otherwise, but our topic today, Victor, painted against this particular current environment, and nothing is assured in property. What are we chatting about? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm, I've got a confession to make. I actually don't watch that much TV, so I actually <laughs> don't know what the 60 Minutes was, although I did get a couple of texts uh, from uh, a few friends saying, mm. you know, watch 60 Minutes. But by the time I had turned the telly on, uh, that moved on to another story. So mm. uh, I'm hearing it uh, anecdotally in terms of what it what it did say. And just to put real context about around what we're doing right now, I can see that you've got a blank piece of paper in front of you. I do. Um, and I, yeah, we've all got a cup of coffee in front of us. And that's, that's how we start. Topic, uh, I think we need to probably talk about what's happening in the market and how when markets change, it's all back to the fundamentals and talking about you know why we buy, where we buy, changing the strategies in terms of making it pertinent to where the market is. Okay, so going back to this 60-minute bit and depending who you listen to in the media, we've spoken about it before, Steve. Um, uh, there's a lot of naysays in the media, big headlines, sell papers, inverted commas, most people read on the internet these days, but... Um, you got to be careful who you trust in the media. But markets do change, Victor, and, mm. and, and to your point, and, and this is just me thinking, you know, the observations around markets change and, and how you need this level of fluidity with your property investment. So your strategy should stay the same, but your strategy is going to involve in line with changing markets. And changing markets isn't negative. Changing markets also are positive. So Correct. a lot of people can look at this period of time as in half empty, half full. And I don't like the analogy, are you a half empty, half full glass type person? But um, a lot of people will be sitting there, shitting themselves um, at the moment if they listen to some media reports about prices in Sydney and Melbourne potentially coming back 40% Mm -hmm. and how that will cripple the economy. Uh, I sit there and I think, okay, that's a lot of negative sentiment in the marketplace. Um, uh, You've got people saying, sell now, sell now, sell now, otherwise you're going to do your dough. You've got all these issues around financing banks that want to lend and they're they're taking over and off interest-only loans and people aren't going to be able to serve it. All sounds really, really bad, but wrapped up within that is – some probably good news for people who are ready to capitalise on a changing market. So Absolutely. We are in a changing market right now. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Steve, that changing market, how do you sort of self-process that in your head? Are you a um, – do you think it's that bad at the moment, this 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 changing market, this potential for, for rapid price drops? I think it is for some people. Mm. But and but it, it'll only affect the people that weren't prepared in any way, shape or form. So this is the fundamentals. The fundamentals because – we're, we're talking about Sydney and Melbourne to, to begin with, yeah, and as particularly Sydney. Uh, Sydney And the 60 Minutes report, not that I watched it either, I, f- I refused to watch it. It'll, it annoyed me and it yeah. would annoy both of you guys. Mm. You'd be sitting there going... Yeah, it's just it's just rubbish. And there was yeah. there was a little just bit of noise. stuff afterwards uh, from the people that featured on the, on the um, report and they were saying, that's not what we said. This is how we said it or it was taken out of context. And I get that's the media's job. And unfortunately for... 
I remember years back, you know, we, as a family, we used to sit around the television and watch 60 Minutes and now it's almost like a glammed up version of a current affair. It's just sensational. I, I, I tend to everything. agree with you and it's a shame that's happened because I, I was watching it and I'm thinking this is the sort of thing you'd expect on today, tonight at 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the evening when, when yeah. people are cooking their dinner, right? It wasn't quality journalism. You know, it was a it was a beat up. It was a scaremongering. I think you know, that's the way to the, put the, it. But the problem yeah. is though, the, the problem I have with it is that we're in a changing market. So this, this is the, the the topic of this podcast is that it's a changing market. What do you do about it, right? Okay. For a lot of people who aren't as sophisticated and knowledgeable as what we are in property investment, they, they're going to think, oh, wow, well, 60 Minutes, um, what 60 Minutes is saying is, is gospel because it's such a quality program. Mm. I better go and sell my property. Well, here it is. So we had, if we go the first, or sorry, the absolute opposite of what that report was, go back four years, three years ago and that same show was probably saying, you know, get into the market, people are making millions, so on and so forth. And people perpetuated the market from a positive point of view, you know, the whole FOMO scenario. Mm. It could quite very well be in the Sydney market, for those that aren't prepared, the exact opposite, but yet the same. So same, same, but different. Perpetuation in a negative sense, get out. So there's a thousands and thousands of properties that hit the market at the same time, whilst the lending environment is mm-hmm. quite tight well, then prices will slide. But the fundamentals are still there. Anyone who didn't realise that after five years they were going to roll into principal and interest, as an example, and didn't start doing something about it 12 months ago or, or at least identifying that it was going to happen in 12 months, well, they've got a little bit of you know, fault of their own there. And people that raped and pillaged their own equity within Sydney when we had 75% and sometimes 100% growth in five years and took that up to 80% LVR, sometimes 90% LVR, having a contraction in the market of somewhere between 15 and 20% in some areas, well, they may be in a negative equity position. Yeah. I'll I watch, think, I'll, uh, sorry, Phil, the, yeah. the thing that we need to identify here is that there are really two types of investors, right? Those that invest via media, in other words, what articles, what news break out in the media, and those that invest via fundamentals. And if, if you're looking at investing via media, this is the time where you'd panic and start selling because you're believing what's out there. Uh, whereas if you stuck to the fundamentals, you weather all types of markets because you're constantly adjusting your portfolio, constantly buying properties within your means, within the complement of what you've already got, so that you know you, you're pretty much weatherproofing your portfolio, and it doesn't matter what the market is doing, because you've got a portfolio that suits your financial fingerprint. And I think just to go furthermore from that, a lot of advisors and a lot of people in the industry talk about the property clock and that's quite relevant, but we've actually got the media clock as well, which we overlay on it because mm. yeah, it can drive or, or kill a market mm-hmm. just as you're, as you're saying. But we've also got a, another graph that we, or set of data that we analysed and, and turned into some graphs whereby a lot of people subscribe to the 7% rule or, or going up by 7% will double in 10 years, whatever it may be. We don't actually subscribe to that. We're a 15 to 20 years term because we're quite conservative. But most investors get out of the market within that sort of five to seven years. And if you look at any compound growth calculator, you'll see that really it does all the heavy lifting or the, the majority of its growth toward the end of the term. Mm. So if you're out within that five to seven years, you're you're missing out on the future. But You've the, just done all the heavy lifting and then you're bailing out. Yeah, yeah, at the wrong time. But that comes down to you know, financial responsibility. If you're going into this thinking you're going to make a million dollars in a very short period of time and you may be lucky enough to do that as you were in Sydney, you're a high-risk investor. Yeah, and traditionally, real estate is for the low-risk mm. investor who's got a lot of time on their side and manages their money correctly. Uh, unfortunately, this is just history repeating itself, just like it was, say, in the, I think it was the 2000s, yeah, early 2000s right. in Sydney, whereby people didn't worry about cash flow. It was just the equity that they were creating. This is awesome. We're creating wealth. We're dipping into that equity. We're spending it and life is large. But they forgot about the cash flow. And this is just exactly the same version with a few different twists to it. People forgot about cash flow management. Yeah. Yeah. So they're looking at just the one side of the equation, which is the equity side of it, right? I I, I need to build up equity rapidly or, or get into a high growth area. And they forget about the holding costs. They forget about the life changes that will have uh, ha- they will have along the way. Mm. And, and and coming back, Steve, to your comment about most people selling within the first few years of purchasing an investment property, it's a testament to them just simply getting it wrong because they're not buying the affordable properties. And the affordable properties being that uh, these are properties that are affordable to them 
And that's in, the point. Yes. Yeah, th- yes. Affordability based on their. It's not cheap. No. It's not cheap property. Not cheap. necessarily cheap property. We're not talking, you know, uh, $150,000 property in regional areas or anything like that. We're talking about affordable in the area that is suitable for their financial fingerprint. So it could be, you know, double bay uh, in that sense. But we, we're looking at an affordable property within there where, let's say, and I'm making these numbers up, let's say everything around you is selling for a million dollars. And you've bought something there for you know eight fifty, that be, makes it affordable from a capital point of view, uh, and, and also makes it more liquid compared to the other properties within that suburb. And then we're also looking at it from then therefore the yield point of view as well. It becomes affordable if you have the the capacity to tolerate the heavy negative cash flow that property will bring, as opposed to a say four hundred thousand dollar property a little bit further out. Where you know your growth, once you've done your fundamentals, once you've once you've looked at all of the things that you do need to look at from an investment point of view, your growth's relatively the same. And uh, in one of the podcasts, we had talked about diversification, and um, uh, we might put it in the show notes, Phil, uh, as to which podcast sure. podcast it was. You're better off buying two four hundred thousand dollar properties as opposed to one eight hundred thousand dollar property, as long as the growth is the same, because you've got far less holding cost, and you've got greater diversification you, you both properties may not be less risk vacant yeah less risk yeah but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't entertain if we're talking about double bay and we're not saying that that's the investment spot but we're just using that as yeah, an analogy an, an that doesn't mean that you shouldn't entertain it and especially if just on your numbers if it's a million dollars and you get it for 850 well you've mm. you've bought mitigation you've got the mitigation yep. on the way in the cash flow will be a little higher because you've bought it a little cheaper mm. and it is affordable based on that price point for that correct that area right yeah. If you want some science around what we're talking about here, that not not holding on property long enough and yeah. uh, selling the right, so there's the uh, Core Logic does its pain and gain report. I yeah. imagine you guys look at it, which looks at nine years. Yeah, people who sell negative to what, so, so at, a, at a price less than what they purchase, and they say that's pain. And then the other side of it is people who buy and sell, and it's gain. And it's pretty simple. The longer you hold on to a property, the less pain you're gonna have, right? And and it it is that simple. Mm. So let's forget all the other science. Around it's a fundamental, it. right? It is. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you will win if you hold it. Long for the enough, long term yeah. in a fundamentally correct And this area, is of course. compounding. This is what Warren Buffett always talks about, the, the, the value of com- compounding time, investment, et cetera. You know, going back to the – it's connected with the 60 Minutes report, Victor. Um, uh, they had those four different people mm-hmm. involved. The investor that was on it was pretty reasonable uh, and it was like uh, 60 Minutes. Uh, well, here's the thing. He's, he's not just an investor. He's actually a property investment advisor as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I didn't know that, but it was like 60 Minutes stumbled onto some groundbreaking idea that – Wow, this guy is really smart. He he didn't buy his dream home as his first home. He actually invested in affordable and yeah. affordable to him, um, yep. affordable properties and rented where he wanted to live. And yeah, it's a term that it's been called rent vesting. It was like that, you know, they've stumbled onto he the was biggest like a secret in the world, yeah. right? And it was an absolute joke. And he was he was he was all right, the guy. And he's going, yeah, you know, people are buying the wrong properties, you know. And yeah. uh, but the the issue with it and and being a journalist and you know being part of that peer group, I can I can, I can criticize. I'm going to have the right to criticise and I might cop some flack for this. The way they package that story up is that it was every single, and to your point, everyone else's fault Correct. except for the person that bought the property. Correct. The reason why, it was a bank's fault. Yeah. Vulturous banks giving out debt to people who shouldn't have it at interest only, lending, uh, they couldn't afford it, they weren't assessed properly, et cetera, all the bank's fault. And then it was the evil real estate agent's uh, fault. Then it was the property marketer's fault, you know. There was, there was a family there who was going through some struggling times. And putting, putting the emotion aside, it's horrible when people struggle because of property. They bought at the top of the market at a really high uh, debt level. You and know? I think, look, there's probably a little bit of truth. Every, you know, all those sectors, the mm. banks, the, you know, the, the, the marketers, everyone probably, there's a little bit of responsibility there. There but is. At the end of the day, it's the person who signs the contract. There's not a gun to the head to force the people to yeah, do absolutely. it. And a little bit of diligence well, my view now, behind it makes there, sense. There is no excuse not to be educated in property None in whatsoever. today's modern age. 20 years ago was a bit different. You know, it's the the world has changed. Correct. But anyone who ever really cared about making a sound and smart financial decision has always done their homework. Well, Always well, done their homework. It's it's amazing, and we've said it before. People will put more research and time into buying the new iPhone than they will property. Mm. It's just suicidal. Yeah, but then that's why they outsource the guys like you, right? Because then you take all the risk, and you know they outsource the risk, right? And that's not responsible either. I think whether you're using someone like us or other trusted advisors, that if there's a certain element or there's a massive element of diligence that you need to undertake yourself because it's your money at the end of the day, and. 
I don't understand why you wouldn't want to be absolutely skilled up when you're about to make such a big dollar investment. Yeah. Yes. One, of the, one yeah. of the things that people do is that they continue buying in an area because that's what they're familiar with. So people continued buying in Sydney as an example. Nothing wrong with that. But then they're, what they're looking at is the instant results that they have seen in the past. You know, when you look at most investment vehicles, there's this fine print saying that, you know, past performance does not guarantee future performance, and, and, you know. And that is true for property as well. You know, we, we, are, we are investing, looking forward, by looking at data that is looking backwards. Yeah, so there's a big mm, disconnect. Good point. Huge there's disconnect. There's a big disconnect. Yeah, and the other thing is that real estate has always been known as the non-instant gratification mm investment class and with what's happened in sydney it suddenly flipped on its head and became this instant gratification scenario where you signed a contract today and it was worth 20 percent more tomorrow literally mm. in some cases and so i think that appealed to a lot of people and we've seen that before in in, in the different market yeah. cycles within sydney as well where people jump on a little bit too late because they're investing via media mm. so the media generally cottons onto these stories because that become the flavor of the month when the market is absolutely booming. Mm. And then everyone jumps into that area. But it's already too late. I mean, from, from a strategic point of view, both for my personal portfolio and for our clients, I exited out of the Sydney market well, some two years ago. I was actually, I was just thinking in my head, I was going to talk about that as well. Mm. So I'm going to hijack that because that's a really good point. So this whole instant gratification and massive growth in such a short period of time, people, like we were in the Sydney market since 2000. Yep. And we weathered a couple of cycles there and we made some very good gains. But people also criticised us for exiting the Sydney market a little early as well. But we did that deliberately because we knew that with such massive growth, there was going to be a contraction in price. And if everybody took an 80% loan to value ratio uh, loan on a massive valuation, as the market contracted, you could actually be left in a period or in a, in a state of negative equity or 100% LVR because the market is contracted. So we exited, well, we didn't think early, but some people stated so, so that we knew that as the market contracted, we were still very liquid in terms of the growth versus or there the price versus the There was still the safety the net in place. There was the mitigation mm. there. And not, a, not just from a capital point of view, but also from a cash flow point mm. of view because we didn't leverage at the massive overstated valuations uh, based on the market at that time. Well, I think we've been bought in Sydney for five years now. You're a, good, you're a great you know, example. You know, we haven't yeah. done that because it wasn't the right thing to do. Fundamentals, right? Mm. Correct. Know, it all comes down to fundamentals. And one of the things that come through going back to 60 Minutes was um, around asset selection, right? So mm. this is this is critical to, to fundamentals. Um, uh, share a story with you guys. I, I caught up my uh, sister. Have you met my sister yeah. before? Um, and I've been at her for years about big property investing. She's quite conservative. She she owns a house up... Um, um, on the central coast, the big thing and stuff. I'm going, got to get the property investment, property investment, property investment. So it sort of finally started to tick with her and she goes, oh, can I come and, can I come and see you? And I'm like, yeah, sure, no worries. Um, and she, she come and had these uh, beautiful glossy brochures of some property she'd just seen in um, uh, Gosford. And she's going, well, I'm thinking about moving to Gosford. I live there. So I'm thinking about buying one of these off-the-plan apartments. Look at all these fixtures and fittings. Isn't it lovely? Uh, and I'll rent out the house that I currently own up in um, a little bit further up the coast. And I went, okay. So why do you want to live there? Uh, for these reasons, for these lifestyle choices, and I went just rent there, see what happens, right? She goes, but I've looked at, I've looked, look at these properties, Phil. They're great. It's a, it's a brand new high rise development. It's going to be the, the, the fanciest thing in Gosford. Um, you know, I looked at these floor plans, and I went, Sheree, if you buy that, that's it for you for mm. ten years. You know, you'll never buy another investment property. It's the wrong oh, choice. Well, well, it's the wrong choice. Mm. A fundamental wrong choice. And the sixty minutes report that the investor who was on there, who you said is a strategist as well. You know, he was talking about asset selection. So most people that are hurting are going to hurt in the Sydney or the Melbourne market are people who have bought the wrong assets at the right at the wrong time. So it might be an off-plan purchase, which is settling, and then they can move in in you know this month, for example. You know, yeah. and and have done it at ninety percent over here. They're going to hurt, right? Yep. They're, they're really, really going to hurt. The stuff that we bought out in the western suburbs, um, and you guys supported it with this uh, sort of five, six years ago. That's all. Most of it's doubled in value, if not a little bit more. If that comes back, if that normalises 20%, I'm still 80% up in the game, right? And you're still above the average growth. And I'm still above the average growth. And it's this is the important thing. And I, But just one further point in terms of uh, the asset selection, and I think you know, whilst we all know that's hugely important, mm. I actually, if you put that aside, for me the most important thing is cash flow management. And I keep talking yeah, about this because 
It's only, if, you, it's only a problem if you've got to sell the property, right? This is the whole point, right? Yeah. So you'll only get your win or your loss if you sell, essentially. So if, if you can ride the ups and downs and go back to the GFC once mm-hmm. again and have a look at the price points there compared to today, if you had the cash flow awareness around you to be able to control that asset through the good and the bad to have you hold the property for that extended period of time, and I say extend because everyone thinks it's five years, but we say 20, then you are good. You mm. are good to go. And it, it is. It's just cash flow management. Control the debt via paying it, meeting your mortgage payments, and you're okay. So if you're not forecasting the fact that you've only got a five-year interest-only term, if you're not forecasting that you're going to have three kids, four new cars, a boat, a jet ski, and holidays, well, then there's got to be an onus upon yourself in terms of taking responsibility. See, mm. people people don't sell because they've lost equity. People have to sell because they can't afford to hold on to the property. That's right? it. So if I come back to your sister's example in terms of uh, buying Gosford in the, off the glossy brochure, right? That property could be a good property, but in a different cycle. Mm. Right now, it's not the right property to buy. It'll be a good yeah. property in 20 years if you Absolutely. bought it today, but you've got to yeah. hold it to that point. That's true. Time. That's yeah. true, yeah. And then uh, the other thing also is that you're heavily into property, mm. right? Yet you've got family members that are not in property, which is true for most people because it's it's the education and it's also um, getting rid of all the fluff that surrounds property investing and getting back to basics. Yeah, and that's why people don't invest. Well, it is, and and you know, for for my sister, I actually went through an exercise and went, okay, what are they charging for these things? You know, six seven hundred thousand dollars, right, in Gosford for a two better, right? Wow. Good views and stuff, yeah. It's going to be the fanciest block there. Uh, everything is everything else is five to ten years old. There's not a lot of high rise development there. It's trans- Gosford's transforming. I'm told. Just to, to yeah. interrupt. I'm yeah. just having these these flashbacks because I remember last cycle when they did exactly the same thing in Gosford. And there's that big development there that overlooks the water. Yeah, can't remember. It's on a steep street. I can't yeah, remember yeah. the name of the street. And around about, I think it was 50% of that block went mortgage in possession from yeah. the developers. And during the GFC, we just bought them mm-hmm. at the right. At the right price. At the right price at the right time. So, so what I did, I said, Shri, let me give you an example, right? So this is going to be a fancy block. Everyone's going to want it. Sure, okay. And I think they've only pre-sold maybe 60% of it. So there's, there's, there's still some available, Steve, believe it or not. There's still some available. Quick, hurry up. Um, and a buyer's agent. Just better get onto that quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, it, this is what it's going to cost. Let's look at what properties, the same properties five years older are selling for in Gosford right now. Very, very different proposition, right? What are they renting at? A lot less than that. So it might be a new property for two years, but then the next big fancy thing is going to come up and then that's going to be even, you know, a, a more premium. There's, they're going to fill that whole CBD of Gosford, I reckon, with, with, uh, with um, you know, uh, off-the-plan mm. high-rise development. So you're going to have huge, uh, huge availability. You're not going to – it's just a bad – it's just a bad investment at this point in time. Yeah. But then something sort of clicked with it and she went, oh, yeah, okay, I'll sort of get that now. I said, use your money. You buy two properties somewhere else with that and it's going to give you a positive yield, blah, 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 blah. And she sort of got it, Right. But this is my sister. She, you know, she can access me or anyone I know, and you know, and I, I, actually, I think I'd said go and speak to you guys. I wonder but, if she's listening to this. Yeah, she's she's probably Phil's mentioning my name. Yeah, again. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's around the education point of view, right? It's it's yeah. all about education, and, and it annoy it annoys me and it frustrates me when you hear these these stories of of people who are hurting through probably because everyone's trying to get ahead. I get that. That's cool, right? And for a lot of people, they see property as um, something that they can control and influence to actually, you know, embark down a path of, of wealth creation for a more favourable retirement. That's all cool, right? Mm. But most people fuck it up, to be yeah. honest with you. You know, and there's no excuse for it. There's just no excuse for it. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. And look, there are some really good salespeople out there that can there convince is. anybody. And in fact, sometimes, you know. Emotion I'll, sells. Well, sometimes Emotion. I think, oh, geez, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good brochure. That's a pretty good pitch mm. that they're giving me. But yeah, fundamentally, we know it's rubbish as well. well. But what I said to her, the thing that really shows you guys, he said he was selling it on the basis that she'll get really good negative gearing. It was awesome. ha- it's how it was sold. Mm. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but th- this, this is the problem, right? So right from day dot, Negative property, gear is a strategy, property, by yeah, the way. That's a strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> From day dot, every, every, everything's been featured around tax benefits and, mm. and so forth, and therefore negative gearing. But you know, like like many of us say, it is just an outcome. Yeah, it, it should not be. Yeah, it's a moment in time. The, yeah, that's right. And it's different for every single person. Hundred percent. And what yeah. happens yeah. if you lose a job? Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got to pay the tax first to claw it back. Yeah. Madness. Mm. So what do we do about this? Uh, how do, how do we get people thinking better about property? How do we we talk about it all the time, Victor? Fundamentals. Think about the fundamentals. Fundamentals. But people just 
forget about them really quickly. That's right. The good guys are successful property investors, mm-hmm. you know, who, who get it. But everyone else just seems to stuff it up. And then we go through the same old cycle of blaming evil banks, evil property spruikers, evil whoever else, rather than the, the person themselves. So yeah. do you reckon yeah. a lot of people listen to this thinking that sounds like me? Uh, I don't know. I don't want to prejudge. But if you look at the stats, and, and I think we talked about it in the last podcast, uh, where there's only 2 million odd investors in Australia and only um, uh, 20 odd thousand own six plus properties, mm. right? So that tells you that they're approaching it wrong or they haven't really thought it through. Uh, and uh, the key to this is is get rid of all of the fluff around this. Look at it from the worst case scenario. If it were to go horribly, horribly ro- wrong, let's say you're down to one income, can you afford to hold on to your portfolio? Or better still, are you able to offload that property really quickly without losing money? Therefore, you're not buying in your mining towns, you're not buying in the Sydney market where it, it is pretty much at a peak and, and declining. Uh, that then get, helps guide you to buying in the right area in line with what you can afford, not not what someone else can and not what the brochure says, but what you can afford and how you can mitigate the risk around it. Pre-tax. Yes. Pre-tax. Yeah. So how do you work out then, Steve, if, if you're treating into this and going, oh, uh, maybe, I don't know if I can weather the storm if there's a storm coming. It might just be a bit of a, you know, a little bit of precipitation that's going to go away. But if it is a storm and uh, and, and everything goes wrong... How do you work out whether or not you can survive a 40% down? Well, you personally, if, if, if prices come off 40%, are you, uh, you on the streets, uh, you know, eating baked beans, cold baked beans out of a tin or... Be knocking on your door. Knocking on my door. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> look, it's, it's... How do you know? How do you work out? If it comes down 40%, I'm not like, you know, I wouldn't like it because yeah. that's eroding wealth. the wealth, but the cash flow is fine. The portfolio, the numbers are fine for me to be able to support it if and this is my worst case scenario and it has been since the day I started if rates go up by 2% and if my rents come back by 20%. So you actually do those sums? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you do the same? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I also have like and once again everybody's scenario is different and depending on the size of your portfolio but I have a year's worth of buffer versus anything that could go wrong because Cash a year money. Capital, yeah, yeah, offsets. Offsets. Okay. Offsets, line of credits, whatever it may be. Liquidity, that's the key. Hmm. Because you, you don't want to be that person that's ever forced to sell because state your wallet dictates the state of your mind and you'll be a, a victim. So you'll be a statistic. Someone like us as negotiators will sense that and will negotiate harder and you'll be forced to take whatever we give, so to speak. I think so, it's, the, it's the question that we need to ask ourselves, right? The question most people tend to ask is what if it goes down in value? That's actually the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, can I afford to hold onto this property during the good times and the bad times? And that and that's where it is. That's that's the the statement mm. because property it'll go up, you'll give a bit back. It'll go up, you'll give a bit back. There'll be no growth for X amount of years. But in the fundamentally correct areas, since Captain Cook got here, property's gone up in value. So you're saying La Perouse is a hotspot then, are you? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> At a point in Come time. On, do you know your geography? At a yeah. point in time. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's always got a test. Huh? <laughs> so, Victor, this is all good, right? So mm-hmm. let, let's let's just summarise. Um, whether or not property's going to go down in Sydney, Melbourne, 40%, I'm not even going to touch that, right? I might, Louis Christopher's on um, 60 Minutes. I might have a chat with him and see what he reckons. I reckon... You know, he's he's he was taken, taken out, out of context, context I imagine. massively, yeah. and he says so. Yeah. yeah. Did, did he did he report on that? Yeah, on, yeah. on uh, apparently Twitter or something like that. Yeah. He just said this is this is rubbish, or this yeah. is they're going to take it this there way. Been, this is what I said. Maybe tiny parts of the market. There was the the, the real estate agent was saying used to be one point two million in my suburb. Now it's one million, so it's two hundred two hundred thousand dollars drop on. But what two. what was it three years ago? Four years ago? I oh, know it, yeah. it never gets touched right. No. So so, but let's say probably comes off. 40% and people, let's say people are forced to sell because they haven't got the cash flow to hold their property. And that might be because they come off interest only to principal and interest. There was some some punter on a thing that said that his loans from interest only to P&I and it went up 53%, right? You know, come on, they can hurt, right? Depending how big your portfolio is. So let's say that happens and people are offloading property left, right and centre. Sell, 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 sell. As buyers of property, how do you capitalise on that? We wait to the right moment in time mm. and, you know, we, we execute it's like we do in every other every other market. It it's 
investors will always invest, especially the you know, in sophisticated investors. They're waiting for the chance or they change their strategy because their cash flow and their, their capital are in the correct positions to be able to capitalise on an opportunity. Forget Sydney and Melbourne though. Like it might be a case where Brisbane's the place to be, Perth or, or, or the ACT or the Northern Territory, whatever. The beauty about real estate and the different markets within markets it's, is it a, gives you the perfect opportunity to diversify because all the markets are moving in random circles. It's as simple as that, yeah. really. And, and then even even in a heated market, you're just changing the strategy and changing the types of property you're buying to mitigate your risk. So as an, as an example, yeah, you could be uh, you could be buying properties that are uh, re- renovation potential or subdivision potential, land banking it, uh, and waiting for the market growth to happen. Which is what we're doing now for yeah, some of the, right. for some of the clients. Mm-hmm. They're taking advantage of perhaps the softer market conditions in certain areas of Sydney and you know, we're buying larger parcels to, to capitalise. So or a land bank, I should say. <laughs> yeah. And sorry, to adjust the numbers as well, um, another good example might be getting uh, some of the small commercial like we are at the mm, moment yep, to, boost, right. to boost the numbers uh, in terms of the cash flow to support the bottom line. Yeah, let, let's explore that a bit more, uh, Steve. Commercial properties, uh, a lot of people think that uh, you, know, you should be jumping into commercial from day one. It is a, um, a very strategic purchase in the sense that it needs to be cyclical. So when, when the residential market is, is pretty much coming up to its peak or has peaked, that's the best time to jump into commercial. The reason being that the commercial will then start taking off because it, it's sentiment, right? So p- people are uh, off the back of heavy equity. They're then going on to start their businesses. They're going to, uh, the economy becomes more robust. And therefore, uh, commercial sector takes off, and uh, particularly in terms of office spaces and and um, less risky commercial. So I'm not talking your petrol stations. I'm not talking your industrial, massive industrial, and, yeah. anything like that. Yeah, something that's that's um, easily offloaded to another mum and dad investor, and we're talking a net um, uh, yield of say six and a half, seven, eight, nine percent, where your tenants actually paying for most of, if not all of your outgoings. So your council rates, water rates, your strata fees and so forth. Uh, it just makes sense to then plug that in, into your portfolio. There is, a, there is a downside to it as well, two downsides. One, obviously, if you are vacant and you've bought in a building that's got the wrong vibe, then obviously that's going to hurt. And if you lose a tenant, depending on uh, the state of the economy, uh, you could be out uh, without a tenant for you know a month or so. Uh, the other downside is that most commercial loans are 15 or 20 years. And therefore, the qualification of uh, further loans for residential is impacted unless you got it right. Uh, so they, they, you need to be sitting down in front of a good broker to be able to map the, all of that out before you jump into commercial. Yeah, 100%. But I think just to, you know, to be sort of fully aware too for the listener is that commercial is a different kettle of fish, yet mm-hmm. some of the same fundamentals do apply. So Absolutely. Fundamentals, number one, area. It, it's like picking residential real estate a lot of the time, mm. especially with the sort of stuff that we're looking at because you don't want to be in a one-trick pony town no. getting massive net yields, but you might be vacant for three years because a lot of the time the value of the commercial property is attached to the rent that it derives. So you still need to be in a high-demand area because – that's a fundamental, um, but it does, and it's not for everybody either. It's it, I wouldn't suggest that a first-time investor just jump into commercial. I mean, some other people will, but it's you know we're a little bit more conservative than that. Mm. Uh, it's for the investors that are looking to perhaps build the bottom line in terms of the cash flow. It's not yeah. for everybody, but it is for some. And and you need to be looking at it from a liquidity point of view. Good Extremely views, important. yeah, good views, good building vibe, so that you know you're able to still offload it in a down market. So if we're talking about yields, what's going to happen with with rents during this this period of market flux? Should they start going commercial up? or residential? Resi. Um, I think in some areas it will come down, and, you know, and we see that already. Mm. Uh, because when you get a lot of investors into the market, and well, and homeowners for that for that matter, and, and prices increase rapidly, what you find is that the rents actually contract because mm. there's more accommodation available. In some of the areas, though, where there is massive off the plan construction, which is still yet to settle. I, you know, there'll be a bit of a bloodbath there in terms of you know, rentability. And for that matter too, I think that doesn't mean every area. That's just certain areas of perhaps Sydney, certain mm-hmm. areas of perhaps Brisbane and Melbourne and, and what have you, and mm-hmm. Perth as well, uh, and potentially uh, Tassie, Hobart. But I think that as with anything, there'll be the ebbs and flows. And as the market starts to flatten out and potentially interest rates go up, 
hopefully there'll be that perfect moment in time where we can start to put our rents up. But I, if I look across my portfolio, there's there's very few places where I'm putting my rents up. I'm just after the stability of cash flow by keeping things as it is. And in fact, some of the properties that I have are under market uh, rent because I prefer constant cash flow mm. rather than an extra couple of dollars a week. Summarise this conversation for me, Victor. What have we just spoken about? That's a, that's a good, that's a good <laughs> question, isn't it? Yeah. Only there was a camera here. You, Come just, on. you just you just got me there. I wasn't even paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, give, give me the three the, th- the three takeaways from this conversation, yeah. Victor. What, Absolutely. What so the, the main thing that we, we need to look at is that forget the noise. Forget the noise. Forget the media. And, except, for this, and except, except for podcasting, this is my problem. Oh, this, right? this, this, is, yeah, this is not media. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is this is premium. This is premium. Yep, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so forget forget all the noise. Get rid of all the noise. Come back to fundamentals, and look for affordable properties. And, and making sure that the portfolio that you've got is affordable to your financial fingerprint. Forget about what where others are buying, what they're buying, and and how many properties they have. Bring it back to yourself. Bring it back to can I survive? Can my portfolio survive the bad times? That's what it boils down to. So, Steve, it's okay to do nothing then. If you if you want to keep creating wealth uh, through property investment, and at this present time, it's not affordable because you've done the numbers, you've self assessed at eight percent, and this, that, and the other, and and you get a, a red number instead of a, a black number. It's okay just not to do anything for Some, a while. So, yeah, sometimes you'll make more money by doing nothing. Mm. Th- that aside, so. I, and going on from what Vic said and to your question, the takeaway for me is broaden your horizons and cash flow is king once again. So make sure. What, what was your saying about the wallet and the headspace or somewhere other? You don't. You weren't paying attention? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't even think about it. No. Nah. <laughs> I was. So, hang on. Hang on. Yeah, right, on, go, on. Yeah, go. Uh, uh, something about... Um, uh, your, your your wallet will dictate your heart or something or other, wasn't I'm it? I'm not that deep. Oh, Confucius. <laughs> <laughs> no, state of your wallet dictates the state of your mind. There you go. Yep. And that's true. 100%. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's supposed to be positive rather than negative. Probably a lot of people, I know people who are under considerable strain and stress because uh, they might have overextended themselves. I think about one person in particular. Um, it's horrible. Yeah, you know? I know. I, we know it, a few it, people. It impacts yeah. every part of their life. You know, and people don't get that. It goes all the way down: friends, yeah. family, you know, kids, relationships, relationships. Yeah. And I yeah. think it, and that it's just not worth it. Mm. Good, enjoyed that. Excellent. Yeah. Was that even the subject that it was? No. That you talked, that you yeah. brought up? No. It was fun. No, no, I close to it, but yeah. we did. That was around, around yeah. fundamentals. I think we uh, the fundamentals yeah. are: do your research, make sure it's affordable, and affordable is a unique thing. It's like a fingerprint, right? Uh, affordability. Mm. It's 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 unique just to you, and uh, affordability to me is making sure that um, it doesn't put any strain or stress on you financially, and there's still upside benefits for continuing to hold property. That's simple, really, really simple. It is that simple. Mm. Cool. Other podcasts that we've done, Victor. How do you find them? Where are they? Or we spoke about it as a diversification podcast last time around. We mm-hmm. did um, questions and answers. We're going to do some more of them, aren't we? Yes, that we the are. idea. So, where can people write in for their questions? So, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. R I G H D. Okay, and and remember to go and check out uh, the podcast. It's uh, wherever you listen to it, uh, whether it's iTunes or any of the other players. Uh, Investing insights with the Right Property Group. Go and check it out. We we pretty much cover everything, right? That's right. Yeah. What are, we, what are we going to talk about next? I have no idea. Maybe it's we'll too far it away. Too far really? away to plan. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, uh, if people do have a particular subject that they want to or want us to talk about, yeah, yeah. shoot us an email. Shoot us so, an email. So you do stuff every choose every second Tuesday night in Sydney. Once right? once a month once in a Sydney. Month in uh, Sydney. Tuesday. Yeah, first Tuesday, and then last Thursday of the month in in uh, St Kilda. So mm, that's in Melbourne. Melbourne. In Melbourne, and and. What's the most common question you get in these days when uh, at your um, your events? <laughs> what's the market doing? What's the market doing? Or where should I buy to make money? Right, okay. that's the wrong question to yeah. ask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, in fact, that may be the topic for next time. Where should I buy? Where should I buy? Ask the where wrong question. I buy? Where are you buying at the moment, Victor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm. I actually bought. <laughs> on, right, I actually <laughs> bought uh, a property north of Brisbane. I've bought one in Melbourne. And there goes that market. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, commercial in Melbourne. Okay. Uh, and I bought a renovator in Logan. In Logan, mm. still is Logan, still good, is it? Yeah, well, it, it, I've changed the type of property I buy to to uh, suit the market there. Okay, what are you getting? Uh, can't, I tell you. Yeah, I can't, can't tell you. Can't yeah. tell you. Yeah, he's a journo. Yeah. He's just prying. Yeah, yeah, he's prying. He's right? prying. Where's the, where's the last place you bought? Personally. Personally? Yeah. Just around the corner from you. 
Uh, he's thinking. He's thinking. I went wrong. What around here? No, 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 no. It. Yeah. Um, I just settled one. Literally, I think it was a week ago in uh, north of Brisbane. Okay. North uh, of Brisbane. Well, that's really specific. Just well, just around the corner from you. <laughs> okay, which one? <laughs> <laughs> and near, near, uh, near the university precinct. Correct. There you go. Uh, and well, I, was it, I was chatting to you about that. You you saying that someone was given an analogy of that's going to be very much like North Ryde Macquarie University. No, that, that wasn't me. No, no. Okay, so no, no. telling me that. No, that's anyway. a big. That's a big call. That was in the brochure. I was in a brochure, yeah. was it? Yeah, it's yeah. a brochure we gave you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I just said a one. I think it was about three weeks before that over in uh, Red Bank Plains. Okay, cool. So yeah, we're still buying. You're still uh, buying. Yeah. Just adjusting the strategy to the market. There you go. And that's a core fundamental, isn't it? Yes. All right. Good. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, more information website, Victor. Rightpropertygroup.com.au. All right. Nice one. And uh, yeah, get those questions coming in. We did enjoy our last Q and A session, and uh, had some really good feedback on it. So uh, make sure you write in. Let us know what you're thinking, and uh, any ideas to Steve's point of um, what you would like us to cover. We are all ears. Um, we'll be back again next time. Until then, bye bye.